you're completing this episode, you should be able to identify the purpose of lockout tagout and describe the general procedure. Lockout tagout is a method for protecting people and equipment by identifying, de-energizing, and isolating potentially hazardous energy sources before performing work on equipment. Here's a general overview of proper lockout tagout. First, notify all affected employees that servicing or maintenance is required and the machine or equipment must be shut down and locked out to perform the work. Next, do an initial evaluation of the job to identify all potentially hazardous energy sources and other hazards. Obtain any necessary work permits and notify personnel work is about to begin. Shut down, isolate, and lock out or block all potentially hazardous energy sources using proper procedures. Apply completed tags to the lockout devices to identify the work being performed and the people involved. Flags are often attached to lockout devices as a way to highlight the locked out and tagged condition. Clear the area of personnel and test energy isolation by trying local switches, valves, or other startup devices to ensure the potentially hazardous energy sources cannot be activated. Once work is complete, the lockout tagout procedure moves to proper startup. First, be sure all work areas are clear of personnel and tools. Reinstall all removed safety guards. All locks and tags can be removed in the order applied or as individuals complete their assigned tasks. The final lock and tag should be removed by the operator. Verify equipment controls are still in the off or safe position and then re-energize energy sources. Discard use tags unless the tags are the reusable type and return locks to designated storage areas. Check once more to be sure personnel are clear and aware of the startup and then restart the equipment to check for proper operation. Be aware your company may have specific procedures somewhat different from these general guidelines, but the principles are the same. To notify affected personnel, identify potentially hazardous energy sources, then isolate and lock out or block the potentially hazardous energy sources so people and equipment are protected while work is being performed. We had just gotten through rebuilding the engine completely. The well, lifters went out, we changed a couple of them. We couldn't do much without the catwalk, so we shut down to get them back in place. We had seven or eight guys, and, and you know, it, it's easy to lose touch of one. Jim got Took the other two bolts off, took the panel out, got in there and started greasing it. And I wasn't aware that he was in there. And I had uh, the crew and the uh, contract mechanic on site and I didn't even think about Jim, you know, since <laughs> I feel we communicate with them well that uh, I don't have to keep an eye on them. After completing this episode, you should be able to identify potentially hazardous energy sources in situations requiring lockout tagout. Lockout tagout is a procedure designed to protect people and equipment by isolating potentially hazardous energy sources before performing work on equipment. What he's saying is, block the juice before you cut loose. Lockout tagout should be performed in the following situations before work is done on equipment, when equipment becomes unsafe to operate, in coordination with other isolation procedures of potentially hazardous energy sources. Identifying potentially hazardous energy sources is a critical step in lockout tagout. Here are six key categories of potentially hazardous energy sources. Electrical, including all energized circuits, 
mechanical, moving parts or machinery like gears, motors, engines, fan blades, and so on. Pressure systems, which may release gases or liquids from tanks, pipes, or valves. Thermal systems, steam or heaters that may contain open flames or burners. Stored energy, batteries, electrolytic capacitors, or gravity systems. Hazardous materials, toxic, flammable, or oxygen deficient atmospheres may result from an accidental release of hazardous materials. All these sources of energy must be properly isolated before any maintenance or repair work can begin. Junior! 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 My first thought was someone's got hurt bad because uh, all I saw was legs and I knew that propeller was turning in there, that prop, and I didn't see no upper body. And I just figured we, someone was hurt and hurt bad. And uh, the blade hit me right beside the head. And then I don't know whether it knocked me back or whether I just jumped to get away from it. You was real lucky there that he didn't even get the scratch. Probably if uh, Jim would have slapped a tag on it, I, I, I wouldn't have started. Just as simple as that. Did you catch all that? Block the shot! Listen up, you won't get bagged if you know your locks and tags. After completing this episode, you should be able to identify lockout devices, tags, and their uses. Lockout devices lock or block potentially hazardous energy sources in the off or safe position, so work can be performed safely on equipment. Common lockout devices include locks, chains, and wedges. Your company may provide other hardware for isolating, securing, or blocking equipment from energy sources. If the isolation procedure involves a keyed lockout device, each person should have their own lock and key. These locks should be standardized and used exclusively for lockout tagout. Never share or loan your lockout device or key. Chains are commonly used to secure valves, flywheels, and other components to prevent the release of kinetic energy. Chains should be locked and tagged after being put in place. Wedges are designed to prevent the movement of wheels, gears, and other rotating components. Be sure to place the wedge so the rotating component would spin onto the wedge if accidental startup occurred. Wedges are typically used as a secondary form of isolation since there is a possibility misplaced wedges could pop out during accidental startup. Okay, let's make sure your head isn't locked out. Okay, let's continue. Tags are used to identify equipment being locked out for maintenance or service and should have the words, danger, do not operate. All lockout devices should be accompanied by a completed tag, including the employee name, equipment being serviced, nature of the work, and the date and time the tag was attached. Never ever remove lockout devices or tags until work is completed and startup is underway. Remember this. Tags are not substitutes for a lockout device. If you can lock it, do it. Sometimes, however, there is no physical way to lock out equipment. In this case, consult your supervisor or safety manual to determine proper procedure. Depending on company policy, tags alone may serve as the way to alert workers to a locked out condition. Flags are often attached to lockout devices and tags as a way to highlight the locked out condition. Check your company policy regarding flag use during lockout tagout. We were making a, a time between a four inch and a two inch. We were swapping lines to more volume to our uh, sales point. Got that completed. Uh, the welders were over in the next hole and I assumed that they were done. Uh, James, we're uh, pretty well wrapped up up here. We talked to pull the skeleton on the produced gas, and in the process, uh, we went ahead and pulled the gas lift uh, skillets also.
we was making uh, one well, you know, one tie and we was finish it. And then we was gonna make a two inch cut to make the last tie in. So we went away and strike and to the to the bevel machine or the torch and then that's when the gas ignited. After completing this episode, you should be able to describe lockout tagout startup procedures for returning equipment to service. Once maintenance or service is complete, the process for removing locks and tags and restarting equipment begins. The re-energizing of potentially hazardous energy sources after routine maintenance or service is called startup. There are four essential steps to startup. Prepare, remove locks and tags, notify all affected employees, and restart and test the equipment. After the job is complete, check the work area for any misplaced tools, equipment, or incomplete work. Make sure that all safety guards are reinstalled and the area is clear of personnel. Next, locks and tags should be removed in the order applied by the individuals who attach the items or as they complete their assigned task, depending on company policy. All tags, except reusable types, should be destroyed after use. Notify all affected employees that the startup is about to begin. Recheck the area to make sure all safety guards are reinstalled and all tools and employees are clear before restarting the equipment. Now, restart the equipment. When using a disconnect switch or breaker, stand to the side of the switch and turn your head away before throwing the switch. Turning your head to the side helps protect you should a sudden arc or flash occur. Check for proper function of equipment and check backup and secondary energy sources. Make sure the equipment or system is fully operational. A supervisor may need to remove a lockout device in an emergency or when impractical for the employee to do so. The supervisor assumes all responsibility in these cases and must inform the employee that such action took place and why the removal was justified. I got the uh, call that we had a fire. I uh, immediately went back to the location where the fire was occurring. Needless to say, my adrenaline was flowing. I mean, I come out of the truck pretty quick, checked, and when I saw all the people standing, I had a sigh of relief. You uh, thank your lucky stars. After completing this episode, you should be able to describe proper electrical lockout tagout procedures. There is a difference between turning off and de energizing electrical equipment. Engaging the stop switch is not good enough because you only disable part of a circuit. Some electrical systems have secondary or override circuits. To properly de energize equipment, you must disconnect the power supply, lock it out, and tag it. All affected employees, especially equipment operators, must be notified of the work activity before power is turned off. A sudden loss of power could cause injury, process upset, or equipment damage. Do an initial evaluation of the work activity with the equipment operators and the personnel performing the work. The evaluation should identify potentially hazardous energy sources for lockout and procedures for obtaining work clearances. Those clearances must be obtained before work begins. After completing the initial evaluation and notifying all affected employees, lockout tagout can be completed in four basic steps. Lock, tag, clear, try. The operator should first turn off the local switch and disconnect the power supply. Then apply his lock and completed tag to the disconnected power supply. 
Never disconnect the power supply of equipment under load. Always shut down the equipment first and then disconnect the power supply. When operating a disconnect switch or breaker box, stand to the side of the enclosure where the switch is located and turn your head away before throwing the switch. This will help protect you should an unexpected arc or flash occur. Locks should be standardized and used only for locking out energy sources. Each authorized employee should have their own key. Others involved in the work should apply their approved locks and completed tags in a predetermined order after the operator. Each employee who applies a lock should also complete a tag with the employee name, date, time and nature of the work being performed and attach the tag to their lock. The tag should have the words, danger, do not operate. Next, clear the area of all personnel. Also, keep all tools out of the area until locks and tags are applied. Before any work begins, try to start the locked out equipment. This is a vital step in electrical lockout tagout because it verifies you have successfully de-energized the correct circuit and overrides. episode, you should be able to identify three methods used to isolate process, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, and hydraulic systems during lockout tagout. Equipment operating with process, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, or hydraulic energy sources requires special attention during lockout tagout because there may be highly pressurized fluid systems in place. These fluids can be safety and fire hazards and must be identified by type and property before work begins. These systems also may have significant amounts of fluid that could be released suddenly as kinetic energy stored in lines, pressure vessels, gas tanks, or similar storage units. In addition to standard lockout tagout procedures, specific isolation methods are therefore necessary when preparing such equipment for repair or maintenance. Blinding, disconnection, and double block and bleed are three such methods. Blinding is the insertion of a metal plate between pipe flanges to prevent fluid flow and should be done as close as possible to the equipment being isolated. And each blind should have a fully completed tag attached. A full rated blind should be used and installed following correct procedures. Homemade blinds are not a good idea. A blind list should be kept for all blinds installed. Disconnection simply means separating the fluid line at a point upstream of the equipment. Flanges or pipe ends should be turned away from each other or moved off center after disconnection to ensure no accidental reconnection or fluid flow between the pipe ends. Like blinding, disconnection should be done as close as possible to the equipment being worked. Double block and bleed means closing a valve to prevent fluid flow then opening a bleed or vent valve upstream of the closed valve to void the system of fluid, and finally closing a second block valve upstream of the bleed or vent valve. Closing the second block valve provides an added layer of protection since there is always the possibility a valve may leak. All block valves should be locked out and tagged after closing. In some cases, chains may be needed to lock the valves closed. Be sure to reuse or dispose properly of all fluid bled from the system. Here's a key point. Any equipment supplying pressurized fluid to the system, such as hydraulic pumps, must be properly shut down, locked, and tagged before using any of the isolation methods discussed. Otherwise, you may get a nasty surprise. On-site policies determine which method to use when isolating equipment using any of these energy sources. Decide on the method during the initial evaluation of the job, then follow all established procedures for isolation. 
System components like hydraulic accumulators or air reservoirs can also retain potentially hazardous energy and should be isolated, released, or de-energized to prevent unexpected release or startup. Using proper isolation procedures for hydraulic and pneumatic equipment will ensure a zero mechanical state while work is performed. Rock the shock. Get ready for a pit stop. Today we're going to talk about flagging and tagging. And at the finish line, it's safety first. After completing this episode, you should be able to explain the importance of tagging and flagging. Tags and flags provide visual communication signaling lockout conditions are present. Tags are used to identify locked out equipment. Tags should be red, black, and white and have the words, danger, do not operate. Space should be provided for the employee's name, equipment being serviced, nature of work being performed, and the date and time. A completed tag should accompany all lockout devices. Tags and flags are not substitutes for lockout devices. If you can lock it, do it. In rare cases where energy sources cannot be locked out, consult your supervisor or company safety policy as to whether a tag alone is sufficient for lockout. Flags are used to highlight locked out and tag conditions in areas not easily accessible or visible. Flags should be orange or bright red in color. Flags enhance communication to other workers that lockout conditions are present. Once work is complete, all used tags should be removed and destroyed unless they are the reusable type. Be sure to throw away used flagging material. This helps communicate that work is complete. Never ever remove lockout devices, tags or flags until work is complete and startup is underway. If you are not part of the work activity, do not attempt to start equipment that is locked, tagged, and flagged. Rock the shock. Rock the shock. After completing this episode, you should be able to identify how to remove lockout tagout devices properly. Remove locks and tags only after work is complete. Personnel are notified and equipment is ready to be placed back into service. Before re-energizing equipment, verify it is safe to operate. Visually inspect the equipment and area to make sure there aren't obstructions, personnel, or incomplete work. Notify all affected employees when equipment and circuits are ready to be energized. Remove all lockout devices. Each employee should remove their own lock and tag in the reverse order the devices were applied depending on company policy. The last person to remove their lock and tag should be the operator who should also remove the multi-lock lockout. The operator should restart the equipment, bring it up to operating conditions and check for proper function. Electrical switch gear should be operated only by qualified personnel. All used tags should be destroyed unless they are the reusable type. In an emergency, or if circumstances make it impractical for the employee to remove their own lock and tag, the supervisor may remove the lock and tag. The supervisor must assume full responsibility for removing the lock and tag. The supervisor is also responsible for notifying the employee that their device was removed and why. That's a wrap! Remember, block the shock! <laughs>